Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vanessa from the Strategic Outreach and Development Team in NSCC. A very warm welcome to our enablement session, co-organized by GeoWorks and National Supercomputing Centre Singapore. Today, we are very honoured to be able to invite speakers from Sabana Jurong, IHPC ASAR, and Centre for Livable Cities, where they will share various scientific mm. expertise, PC capabilities, and some real-life use cases. Our agenda for today will be as follows. Our speakers will present first before they answer your questions at the end of the session. Feel free to submit your questions here on Zoom using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, let's welcome Bernard, Director of Strategy, Planning and Engagement from NSCC to say a few words before he shares more about NSCC. Bernard, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vanessa, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is keeping safe and I really appreciate your time today uh, to come uh, for us to share with you this very new, exciting um, uh, enablement session we have. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Joe Works uh, for hosting and co branding this event with us. It is indeed a pleasure. At the same time, I would like to uh, thank our speakers, uh, Eugene from uh, Sabana Jurong, um, Jen from uh, CLT, Center for Livable Cities, and then Professor Po from ASAR IHPC. They are all experts in their respective field who will be sharing with you all the use cases that's going to be very relevant as you look towards the next phase of research development and planning itself. Okay, now this uh, enablement session is one of our many outreach enablement sessions. Uh, last week, uh, coincidentally, we had one with MEF, which we enabled all the financial institutions in Singapore. Okay, and it was a rousing success. And similarly, we will hope this will be one of the many enablement sessions that we could share with you the ecosystem that's available the scientific talent that's uh, uh, available in the ecosystem. At the same time, what is available from a high technology infrastructure level, such as NSCC. We hope to be your partner uh, to go on this journey itself. Now, before I go into introduction of um, uh, this um, uh, NSCC, uh, I believe I have the uh, Chief Executive of uh, NSCC here. Uh, may I ask Prof Tan to say a few words? Prof Tan? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bernard. Uh, my name is Tin Wee and I am the uh, uh, Chief Executive of the National Supercomputing Centre. And uh, indeed, it's an honour for me to see so many of you here, especially the panellists uh, who have taken time from their busy schedule to come uh, uh, give us their, share with us their uh, expert opinions. Mm. And uh, for NSCC's team, uh, to thank them for uh, putting this together in collaboration with uh, colleagues from GeoWorks. Um, we have a mission uh, to mm. share with you uh, the wonderful uh, resources that uh, the, uh, the country has uh, put together for all of us here and to uh, explain to you um, the, the multitude of ways in which uh, all of us who are carrying out research in whatever fields that we are involved in, uh, that you can uh, do quite a lot of things with a supercomputer of the scale that uh, we are running over the last five years. Going forward, uh, we will be procuring another far bigger system, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, we will find users amongst uh, all of you. So on this regard, uh, thank you so much um, for taking time off your schedule, and uh, please do listen to our expert speakers because they, of all people, have realized the importance of using HPC, and they'll be here to share with you how uh, you can reimagine the future with high-performance computing. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Tan. Bernard, are you still here? Yes, sorry, I'm actually speaking on uh, mute. Okay. So uh, thank you, Prof Tan, for that quick introduction. Now, please allow me to now set the stage uh, 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 for our speakers as well as for NSCC. Now, COVID has done what many government officials, CEOs and CTO found hard to do, and that is to actually to accelerate digitalization. And it actually changes how we live 
engage and work. Government official, business executive all have vital roles to play in this, uh, to play in guiding their country and organization to function effectively through COVID-19 as well as post-COVID itself. The scale and impact poses a real threat to a organization's survival, a nation's continuity, as well as how an industry will perform in the future itself. It has also significant impact every aspect of our life, from a national com uh, competitive advantage, enterprise, economies of scale, financial system, as well as society and everyday life. It is really reshaping the way we know it. So the speed and the need to digitize a nation, a business, has gathered even greater momentum and urgency on that basis. So it is vital for our government agencies, enterprises, IHLs, to actually leverage on high performance computing technology, as well as scientific methods to achieve innovation with agility and precision itself. I would like to share with you this, what I call the Trinity. This, there are three key pillars here, concept and idea, scientific talents, and high tech infrastructure itself. With the emergence and a convergence of this tree, Trinity itself, this is where innovation sparks will bring us to greater height. Now, at the same time, digitization has given birth to an avalanche of data. The ability to make this purposeful use of this data is the power to new innovations such as AI, IoT, predictive analytics, simulation, uh, CFD, uh, autonomous vehicles. The, the, the possibilities are endless. So we are actually seeing an increasing demand for compute and GPU resources and scientific knowledge to address and power this answer to this new innovation itself. With supercomputing resources, innovators no longer need to downsize the problem, or, and they actually can respond to the market with much more precision, as well as agility and speed itself. So what is HPC? Really, HPC, or high performance computing, or we also call it supercomputing, is the ability to process huge amount of data and perform complex calculation at high speed. It is through data that groundbreaking scientific discoveries are made and game-changing innovation are fueled. As well as the quality of life is improved around the world itself. So therefore it's critical that we embark on a new path, whether it's COVID or post-COVID, whereby technology will be able to power our next innovation and the next improvement on that basis. To keep a step, a step ahead of com uh, competition, organization need a reliable infrastructure and processes to store and analyze massive amount of data. Later on, I will be sharing with you what infrastructure capabilities that NSCC has that you can leverage. And then later our speakers will share with you how through their scientific modeling approach as well as their thinking, together with HPC, they actually are able to create new innovation as well as solve a real life problem itself. Okay, so HPC is the foundation and, and an enabler to allow a nation, a company, and an individual to really achieve scientific breakthrough to solve complex ch uh, challenges itself. So uh, it, it is indeed my pleasure uh, to share with you right now uh, more about NSCC. So if you allow me to share my screen right now. Okay, I trust that um, you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, let me put it in presentation. Give me a minute. Okay. Okay, first of all, uh, please allow me to share. Um, as you can see, uh, there's lots of logos that natural fact NSCC has been operating for the last five years and we have been pretty successful. Uh, the, the four founding uh, founder of uh, NSCC is actually ASTAR, 
NTU, NUS, and SUTD. And through the years, we have garner lots of new users from TCOM, NEA, Sing Health, as well as uh, very soon some of the uh, new partners, including NUHS and CR Group, which is the uh, uh, parent company for um, Shopee and Garena, which I believe most of you will be very familiar with. Now, our vision is actually to democratize access to supercomputing to support Singapore's R&D initiative. But more important, uh, it's not just to offer uh, a service, but we also like to use this as a available resource to attract industrial research collaborators around the world itself. And this is where, as I said, innovation actually create, uh, uh, is created. So it's enhanced Singapore research capabilities. Now, a uh, very quick overview about NSCC. Um, NSCC actually is funded by NRF, which is under the PMO office, and we are hosted and managed under ASAR itself, as you can see here. Okay. Um, as I mentioned to you, um, we are a national research infrastructure, so we're actually a national level resource that's open to all national initiatives that covers IHL, or the research institute as well as uh, 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 industry player itself. Other than offering supercomputing capabilities, we are well equipped with high-speed network that's local as well as inter interconnected globally itself. Also, we are the first national PETA scale facility in Singapore. Now, our current system is about one PETA flop, okay, with 13 bytes of storage. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the technical aspects of it. Uh, the reason I'm sharing with you is that uh, these are the resources that's available to all of you as well for you to apply and use. Uh, we have uh, at the bottom uh, uh, bottom left corner, you will see that we also have an AI platform. And we also have a HTC system as well as a Copen system. Just FYI to all of you, the Copen system is actually for NEA to do their climate research modeling itself. Now, um, our current system itself is very unique. Uh, as you know, supercomputer actually runs very hot, but we use warm water to do the cooling itself. Okay. And also it is a digital twin enabled data center itself. Now, exciting news that I want to share with all of you is the come the, uh, Q3 and Q4 of this year, our second uh, supercomputer will be real. Our first computer is called Aspire 1, as you can see. So very obvious, our second supercomputer is called Aspire 2. Um, but I'm very happy to, um, to share with you that we are in the uh, process of building it and it will be available and it will be 10 to 15 times bigger, faster than Aspire 1, okay? Therefore, there will be a lot of capacity to allow you guys, all of you to actually use these resources. Now, at the same time, we actually work very closely with a lot of government agencies, including AISG. Uh, AI, as you know, is actually a very hot topic and uh, we have a very good AI system that's available as a V100. Uh, very soon in Aspire 2, we will actually take a few leaps in terms of providing AI capability. So um, it allows uh, all sorts of computational. So it's definitely a, a very exciting development moving forward for AI itself. Okay. Now, uh, NSCC actually support wide range of national initiatives. Um, and one of them is actually in the healthcare. So as you get earlier, you've probably seen NUHS and Sing Health logo there. Uh, we also uh, support national initiatives such as the SG10K project, okay, for precision medicine. Um, and this is where we would help to do the genome sequencing itself. Uh, similarly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are heavily involved in climate change. So this is actually the Cray computer that's supporting, uh, we call it Copen. Uh, for uh, after the famous uh, uh, climate uh, scientists. And also, I just want to share very quickly is that uh, we are very well connected in Singapore 
uh, as, as you probably one of the biggest question would be, well, I have huge data. I mean, I'm crunching a lot of data. I'm training a lot of AI models, you know. I'm doing 3D simulation of Singapore maps and there's a lot of data and it's very difficult to transfer. Do not worry because we are uh, uh, connected via a long haul infinity band that allow big transfer of data. It could be up to 100 GPS. Even you have collaborators overseas, whether it's in Japan or in, uh, Europe, as you can see on the top right hand co uh, corner, you will see that we are well connected globally. So uh, Singapore as a open economy, we are well connected to ensure smooth collaboration across the globe. Okay, now to another few example of a very impactful projects uh, supported by NSCC. Uh, as I said to you, as you can see, it is multifaceted, multi-industry, in, uh, and and it um, and we are more than happy if you have certain problem statement that you have in mind, but you don't know how to start, and you want to use use cases of. Uh, world-class uh, uh, examples, do contact us. And we will be more than happy to find the right use cases to share with you to jumpstart your R&D capabilities. Uh, okay, uh, just quickly to share, because I think more the, the more relevant one is actually what our, our great speaker is going to talk about. Uh, this is one uh, initiative to, to wear a mask or not to wear a mask. This was actually done last year uh, for for parliament and and this is where we do the simulation itself uh and also we look at urban planning how to cool singapore in a very natural way where we do heat mapping of the entire singapore itself and how to actually use uh, uh various uh, data points to actually measure cooling and develop strategy to support a decision making system itself so these are very good examples that's already been done. And if you do want to have uh, some of this uh, use case, we are more than happy to share with you, including um, the simulation for a um, an offshore marine itself. Now, as I said, I'm not gonna go through this. The, all these uh, um, uh, slides will be made available, including the video recording after this session. And uh, we'll be sharing with all of you and hope you all of you will actually use it itself. Uh, lastly, um, yesterday we just con concluded our supercomputing Asia, where we had almost over 1,000 attendees from 30 countries. Uh, Singapore, we are actually well positioned to collaborate with a lot of international scientists as well and international supercomputing centers. All right. So uh, one of the things that I just want to share with you, very exciting, is that the world's fastest supercomputer is called Fugaku, based out of Japan. Uh, we have an MOU in place. In nature fact, if you have one groundbreaking uh, uh, research or project they are doing and you really want to use the world's fastest supercomputer, give us a call. We can set up for you. Okay. So um, it is very in, in, indeed a very uh, great pleasure to be speaking to all of you. As I said, it is, it is through sharing that we actually able to share all this critical uh, in, uh, best practice as well as uh, sharing of uh, connecting you with the right resources and scientists. So do not hesitate to contact us and we will be uh, working through you with a few more of this initiative. Um, uh, this is not going to be the one off and therefore um, uh, we'll be more than happy to conduct more classes as we go along. And my apologies, my dog is just barked and he just told me my time is up. So I'm just going to hand the time back to Vanessa, all right? Thank you, Bernard. Next up, we have Mr. Eugene Xia, Senior Director of Special Projects from Sabana, Jurong. Eugene, would you like to share your screen? Hi, Eugene. I think you're on mute. Uh, yeah, sorry. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So um, I'm going to be sharing with you on the uh, the aspect of uh, of a consultant how we've used uh, uh, um, high performance cloud computing and also cloud computing uh, itself to and we can as we show you the difference and also uh, why 
uh, we actually use it in the, in the realms of sustainability and also in this case, resiliency. Uh, because resiliency, especially in the, how do you support the 17 SDGs uh, that's going to be, uh, it's going to be something that's, that's a hot topic right now. And that has also been weaved in into the ISO 37100 on smart, sustainable and resilient cities. So, So in terms of simulations for uh, how we approach uh, sustainability, we, we, we have to look at things like building constraints, uh, the weather data, uh, and look at what technological products out there to help us to collect information. How do we weave this into uh, different types of competencies in terms of certification standards? That, that you give, it will give you uh, design optimization. Uh, optimization. Uh, but then, there's a new trust now on things like climate responsiveness, uh, building as material banks. How do we look at innovation? Um, you, we, we are also looking in things like, because we are working very closely with BCA, so you must see how all these ties in together with um, uh, constructability and, and buildability. So time is, an, is, is an, as of the essence as well, and cost as of, and of course, we need to look at it uh, holist, holistically. And that's where um, it, we are now aligning ourselves uh, not only to the 17 SDGs but to 37100 um, as because uh, it is our hope that you know when Singapore becomes uh, certified under 37100 uh, we will be there to, to, to work on it as well. Uh, so far as only one city in Chongqing has, has been uh, certified under this uh, new ISO and it's something that we are very excited if Singapore moves into it. So with all these information inside uh, we, we are looking at you know uh, simulations and CFD is always is, is a must, but we are we are seeing that it's getting more and more complex. Uh, we had issues uh, at a point of time because of the during the COVID, we had to design the expo hall to be negative pressure, and there were so many different um, parameters to take into account consideration because there were many many doors, many many openings in the roof, uh, and before it gets. Uh, 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 certified uh, that's, that we, we need to make sure we do the certific um, the simulations before the test. So when it comes to heavy uh, number crunching, and I remember those uh, uh, last year when we would start we started looking into this, um, we we didn't have the opportunity uh, to look into uh, using supercomputers. So we were using cloud, and but that still take uh, took time because they were. And I like to use the word compound data that had to come in, and we we couldn't just uh, you know we couldn't get the, the results faster than we, we would like to. But there's a lot more things that's also we have to look at things like haze, weather data, and you know once weather comes in, it's it's going to be quite complex as well. Floods, and when I say floods, it's I'm not just talking about uh, just a. Uh, 2D flood, I'm talking about compound data floods where you have storm surge, for example, you have wind, you have the tides, uh, you have rain, precipitation, and then you add in the, the issue of the uh, ground conditions, right? So there's, there are um, many, many things that we will look out uh, for, and that's where we see uh, we, uh, the use of uh, high performance cloud computing coming in. Of course, thermal comfort, and I, I think Bernard has, uh, has also spoken about that and how we use uh, weather, weather uh, data as well. Now, if welcome to a world where you know when we want to, we have to design twice uh, in digital, but we can actually carry out all the simulations that we want to do, uh, and it's no more just a single data uh, um, simulation. We can we can actually do a, a compound data. Uh, for example, you have wind plus rain plus uh, wind plus rain plus the shape of, of of shape of buildings. Put this, you get wind driven rain uh, calculation now. Uh, in our experience, if we if we do it, um, of course, cloud gives us the, the the ability to get to get speed. But um, again, I'm actually seeing that uh, we need to run many many iterations, and that's where I see that uh, uh, the the use of um, high performance cloud computing is uh, it's good. So this is a, just an example that I'm I'm showing, whereby we have we have cloud computing, right? You have geometries, and of course, we do mesh. It's quite straightforward, but of course, when we use uh, HPCC, it's more flexible, faster, uh, stronger computing power. Um, and this is, I, if you ask me, my my, you know, in terms of the, uh, this is where the benefits actually come in. Is where, well, you can actually do multitasking in simulations in parallel, for example. But take all that and you put it into uh, uh, complex multitasking. Uh, 
where you put when you have several data that's a compound data that's actually coming together uh, that's where I see HPCC uh, the, 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 the benefits is uh, will be will be reaped uh, we have actually used it once and, and straight away you know we can see that hey uh, the information on the on the flood is very very uh, uh, it's very fast very practical uh, and we are started, we're trying to, to, to work together with Bernard to see what more things we can do, uh, especially not only Singapore, but even projects in China and, and, and Vietnam. So this is just one example whereby not only do we take into consideration the terrain uh, and rain, but we also look at how floods, uh, you know, uh, flood waters will actually flow, right? And of course, where we come in as, as, as a as consultant is that you can actually have a billion dollar solution or you can have a three hundred million dollars uh, solution, and and of course, developing countries, you know, where, where capital may not be there, they want to take it in phases, stages, uh, and that's where we're saying that you know you can actually look at um, where the high points are, where the critical points that you need to protect, uh, where the critical points that you can actually flood. Uh, for example, parks. I mean, when it's raining, you I don't think you'll be walking in the park, right? So you can actually channel water into that that, that area or low-lying areas or flood basketball courts, swimming pools, sports facilities, um, so, so that they can actually hold, hold, hold the water uh, before it's, it, it floods uh, the rest of the areas. And that's where in master planning, it, it comes in to say that, look, well, if we, we, we can reject certain data, we can run many, many, many compound iteration, uh, data iterations and, and be able to then come up with a design. These two may look very, very <laughs> similar, but uh, if you look, at, you look, look carefully, uh, this, this portion of the Residential, for example, it's not flooding, whereas in this case, it's flooding here. So this, because why the water is actually uh, uh, diverted to and deepened this, uh, this park area. Uh, and, um, and, and that's the reason why certain, uh, most of the residential areas are actually safe, bringing the value of the, the, the area higher. Last thing I would like to discuss about is this is uh, our own um, uh, virtual city that we, has, we have actually created. Um, this is a bit different from the virtual Singapore project, um, and this is something where we put in uh, the uh, shapes of buildings and some attributes, but uh, you can very quickly see, uh, you'll be able to do some path analysis, uh, you'll be able to know um, with open data where, where uh, for example, this is, I, it's, it's connected to my uh, platform in Sabana Jurong, and you'll be able to know uh, different assets, whether is it man trap, uh, whether the assets is work, working or not, and you know it's really uh, a good uh, a digital twin uh, data that you, you, you can actually see. But just want to move very quickly to this area where, whereby you can track energy, um, and also you can actually compound, conduct some flooding to actually know where, where and what, uh, you know how flood waters will actually run, uh, uh, in using a, a compound data. Okay, so this is something that we, we, we are looking at and they've developed it ourselves. So that's all I have to share. I think my 15 minutes is up. Yeah, and uh, I'll be looking forward to uh, answering questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugene. Um, next up, we have Dr. Po Hee-Ju, Senior Scientist and Domain Specialist of Built Environment from IHPC AFTA. Dr. Po, would you like to? Okay. Um, yep, thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, hi, um, uh, my name is uh, uh, Po from uh, uh, IHPC AFTA. I'm also doing the adjunct teaching in NUS Department of Building. So the topic I'm going to share with you today is about the wind load prediction in the virtual urban landscape. Uh, mainly for the greenery and also tree stability management. So um, this is the content of my presentation. I will say something about the integrated environmental modeler, which we have, uh, which we developed jointly together with HDB uh, many years ago. So we have come up with the first version and also the application to the, to the virtual Singapore because it's an open source code. So it allows us to do the integration. So uh, about Virtual Singapore, also we have two projects. Number one is the point cloud modeling, two is a wind load prediction, that's my talk, and also the future applications. So um, as presented by the previous speaker, urban digital model has become more and more pervasive. So in terms of planning and visualization, it has been extensively used. But, but to use it for the modeling and simulation, there's another 
aspect that require a lot of the uh, the, the the computational effort in terms of uh, geometric cleaning, make the data interoperable, and uh, make the water the the mass mass quality good for wind, shadow, solar irradiant, thermal, and noise uh, to be coupled in the single platform. So um, recognize that this is one of the urban mod uh, environmental modeling tool that's required by by the by the agency. We have worked together with a uh, government agency to in, in order to come up with the modeling platform that integrate master planning, urban design, and the environmental modeling. And this integrated process also allow us to couple it to the uh, virtual Singapore geometry with the semantic information in order to carry out the solar irradiance, wind flow, temperature, and noise simulation in a in 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 an interactive manner. Um, um, as you know, you know, architect can always come up with a design, three design in one day, but simulation will take three days for one design. So uh, simulation is always playing a catch up game for the, as far as design is concerned. But we want to make this modeling and simulation you know, at a faster pace as presented by the earlier speaker. We really need to make the modeling and simulation more seamless more, um, uh, and, and also uh, uh, at, at a faster pace. So in this case, our our IEM is able to integrate to the uh, to the platform. Uh, in this case, is a proprietary platform for the virtual Singapore, and we also come up with the uh, with the model selection such that the viewer can just go to the site, then use a window to click on the building that he want to model. Then uh, we 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 create the wizard in order to to, to perform the modeling and simulation. And uh, this is some of the you know, uh, software development that we have the potential to uh, to come out, and we have uh, we have also modeled the simulation according to different semantics. For example, with and without the void deck, what would be the wind flow look like? But as I mentioned, in the urban modeling, there's a lot of issue with the semantic data because the what you see in the in the virtual platform, in whatever platform that is collected through uh, you no know, country. It is uh, for visual and viewing only. It probably lack of the biology or physical semantic uh, accuracy, and also uh, uh, it's not so effective in, fun, in terms of the scalability to model it, uh, to, the, to the simulation. So, so in IHPC, we also have a group that is very skillful in the geometrical modeling that are able to form the point cloud, uh, to, to collect the primitive point cloud model, then use the branch uh, classification according to the intensity of the point cloud, uh, that separate the leaf and the branch and use the, the, the auto classification in order to, uh, uh, to, to do the connection for the whole tree and come up with the tree crown, tree branch and trunk uh, according to the tree species. And this, uh, th uh, this one, we also have uh, our unique algorithm in order to get the shortest path and form the full connectivity. So uh, ultimately, we are able to come up with this model called Three factor model. Three factor model. It is uh, it is a, a, a three geometrical model that is more suitable for the modeling and simulation rather than a, a, a haphazard and also random random tree, which is uh, which will have uh, put a lot of constraint for the modeling and simulation. We also make it in such a way that the computational mass is of uh, a reasonable size because one tree if already have a more than million cell. Imagine Singapore have uh, three, two, three million trees. So if you are going to model for the whole Singapore, that is a, that's an enormous task. Uh, so the, the three factor model is something that we come out. Then subsequently, we apply the three factor model in both wind tunnel and also in the urban virtual landscape in order to come up with the simulation result and make an informed decision to the uh, to the planner. In this case, uh, and our work uh, collaborating agency and park. To, uh, for them to use the tool in the virtual urban landscape for the tree management. And just a snapshot to show you that uh, using the actual point cloud model, the typical tree species that we have do the, uh, the scanning and also collect the data. Uh, no, from here, you can see um, about uh, 10 tree species that we are looking at. It cover 30% uh, population of the, of the tree database in Singapore. So we, uh, we uh, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, uh, from the point cloud model, we established the three species the factor parameter in order to come up with the trunk, crown size, and bottom. And ultimately, uh, we also make it such that we are able to perform the 3D printed model for the factor tree and put
put it into the wind tunnel because if you want to more uh, to, to get the, the the actual data it's always uh it's always necessary it's always important to look at the uh the the, the validation so in this case we work together with our counterpart from mechanical engineering uh, department in NUS, then they also use the 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 the, the uh, three crown. They also come up with a randomized tetrahedral element in order to uh, to to use a porous volume to to represent the crown and also do the three D printing for the porous volume. So um, we come up with a way to use a MATLAB code to and 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 from the uh, fractal three model. We generate the tetrahedral elements and create the crown of the one of the uh, particular uh, species. In this case, the yellow flame, uh, because this thing is very important for us to match the leaf area density distribution. For those who have, have deal with tree, you know, you know that leaf area density is one of the very important parameter that will affect the the the, the solar shading, affect the drag, affect the the evapotranspiration. So we want to get the material, uh, the, the, the porous media property that is matching the real life. So that's why in this case, it also requires some of the, uh, some of the engineering calculation. So typically the botanists can go to get the, the tree uh, leaf area density uh, measurement using manual one. But for us, for the computational work, we can always depend on the, uh, on the geometry to look at it. So very interestingly, as you can see, we can uh, perform the scale down model to measure the drag on the tree. There's also, you know, if you have the resources, you can put the living tree on the truck, you know, a mobile tree, then drive the truck at certain speed and measure the drag, the, 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 the drag coefficients. So there, there are various ways to look at it. But at the end of the day, I, I think all of you would also agree with me, computational modeling would be a way to go. Uh, because since we are uh, able to use a high scale, uh, uh, high speed supercomputer, that we should leverage on it. So in this case, uh, from the complex uh, point cloud model of a Kaya tree, we are able to uh, generate the tree crown and put it into uh, to the leaf area density that have the property similar to the real life. And we also do the side to right um, uh, comparison between the, 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 the actual one in terms of the uh, frontal area ratio and also the, the model frontal area ratio. There's not, there is, uh, of course, we cannot expect a one-to-one -one matching, but still a reasonable value has been obtained. So as you can see, this is the, the rain tree along the side of the uh, road. And this is what we have uh, regenerated using the uh, randomized tetrahedral element at a various angle. So visually, it seems uh, quite good in terms of matching the porous media property for the leaf area density. So after that, we put the tree in the wind tunnel, rotate at different angle, then blow it at 10 meters and 15 meters uh, speed in order to get the flow behind the tree using the PIV measurement. and get also get the velocity profile uh, upstream and downstream so as you can see there is a velocity decay when the flow go over the tree so these things has been captured in the measurement so in our simulation it will make our simulation life very easy because we are able to get the important input in terms of the leaf area density and also the porosity so as you can see the drag coefficient the drag coefficient also changing with the different rotating angle for the different tree species so in this case, you know, after getting the important parameter, we, in this case, the porosity from the, and also leaf area density from the wind tunnel, we put it into the, our, our numerical, so-called numerical wind tunnel uh, simulation, then perform using the high fidelity of the discrete time momentum source. And uh, we discrete time the tree, the tree volume to the, you can, if your computational resource permit, we can use five by five, 10 by 10, 20 by 20 type of the elements to represent the tree in a porous medium, then from there, you'll be able to get a more, uh, uh, no, no, um, um, uh, more detailed simulations. So in this case, what I show to you is that uh, we are using the, uh, we are using the uh, high fidelity of the large eddy simulation model to perform the simulation. Then um, what we obtain is that if you are using the average, average uh, uh, one single porous media, you will miss out the velocity decay, but using the high fidelity turbulence model, you are able to get a, a, a reasonably uh, good uh, comparisons. So after gaining the confidence for the single tree, we expand it and apply the model in, 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 in the urban landscape. In this case, you can imagine in a typical area, uh, typical town in Singapore, they have already they already have more than 5,000 trees. And we are probably the first one in Singapore to model every single tree along the roadside 
coupled with the building, coupled with the terrain, and coupled with the with the, with the, with, the, with the urban, urban geometry, and look at it from the uh, from the tree stability point of view. What is the drag that is experienced by the by, by, by this simulation? Then, uh, of course, uh, from the information that given by uh, by MPAC, as one can see, when the wind is blowing at a certain uh, direction, in which we can get from mass station data, what would be the, the you know you can see this is probably the high uh, flow channel, and uh, this uh, uh, whatever that is have the blue one that means low low risk, but that one that have the velocity uh, that is higher in this case the velocity scale ratio that's higher, you have to pay attention. Then this is very useful information. For the urban uh, for the land, uh, greenery landscape planner, so in future what you're going to do is that this is the actual case, but we cannot make this result generalized. So we are going to come up with a platform that make the informed decision to the planner that with the tree that you have the certain frontal area ratio and also the the the, the, the plant area ratio, what would be the parameter that will affect the tree uh, the the tree list in terms of the, uh, the the tree stability and also the High, high channel wind and it will affect the drag coefficient. So in this case, we will come up with the workflow that will allow the planner to, to make the, use the informed performance-based uh, simulation results and uh, advise them how to uh, get the better positioning of the tree in order to minimize the entry release. So my last slide you're talking about uh, is, uh, is that we have successfully created the integrated environmental modeler which is a multi-physics urban climatic model platform for the wind, solar, irradiation, and shading. So we also uh, couple this to the Virtual Singapore Wizard uh, in order to extend the usage for, for, the, for the urban planner. So you know, we, we also extend this one to look at the, the wind load prediction on the tree in order to examine you know, uh, all, all these important uh, decision-making such that uh, urban forest planning, uh, prioritize the tree pruning activity, it can be obtained from the simulation as long as the input parameter is correct and validated. So with this, I would like to end my presentation because it's uh, yeah, just nice 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, Vanessa, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Po. Hey, yeah. Hi, Vanessa. Sorry, uh, I, I just want to add on to what uh, Dr. Po has said. Uh, uh, NSCC was one of the collaborators for the IEM, and this IEM uh, is actually it's already installed and available on our supercomputer. So, uh, the, for those who are interested, uh, definitely you can reach out to us in IHPC. Okay. Yeah, th thanks, Bernard. I think I missed out the very, very important point. Yes, we have worked with NSCC for the past three months and we already installed the IEM in NSCC. Yes. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I can verify it because I personally, I also work with, uh, no, work with Bernard, work with Eugene, they all to, to, yeah. to, yeah, great. Okay. okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Lastly, let's welcome Ms. Genevieve, Assistant Director of Research from Centre for Livable Cities, Singapore. Genevieve? Would you hey. like to yep. Can you all see my screen? Yes, Jeremy. Yes, we can see. Yeah, so uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, I'll just give a quick introduction on myself. Um, I used to train and work as an architect and then um, as a designer as well. And then I got really interested in spatial analytics in urban design. And I think in, in the near future, it would be nice to see how um, you know, spatial analytics can inform uh, design. So today I'll be talking about the main, uh, one of the projects that we have been working on in the CLC, where I lead the complexity science team. So the project is about how street network spatial modeling and anal analysis can help planning processes within uh, the government. And also touch briefly on how high performance computing played a role in this. So the overall project goals was to develop a model that could measure accessibility and also to design a robust methodology to address the use cases and um, test design options and master plan proposals. So giving before and after scenarios. Uh, but in general, it's to generate um, and provide urban planning advice so that it can help the government uh, make well-informed planning policies. So this is what the space insects uh, model, uh, street network model look like. It can do many things. It can also not do many things. Um, but two of the main things that it can do and I will demonstrate today is firstly, it measures uh, 
accessibility of existing and proposed master plan. So we have the existing street network of Singapore. And for example, if uh, uh, JTC or a, a property developer gives us their master plan for you know in 20 years, we're able to model that and then provide a impact an, um, an impact assessment of the increase or decrease in accessibility, you know, plus 2%, plus 3%. So in, it gives a, a, a numerical value that uh, we can systematically test. And we know we can in, uh, give advice on the master plan proposals. And then the second thing that it can do is to uncover any hidden potentials in urban structures and urban street network, for example, for cycl uh, cycling routes, for pedestrian routes, and to identify if there are any missed opportunities uh, that has been overlooked. But essentially, the whole idea of the network model is not to make a uh, maximum change, because what we don't want to do is to reconfigure the whole of Singapore, and then that will cost a lot of money, and there's also no point. What we want to do is to see uh, where we can, you know, perhaps add one or two street connections, or take away one or two street connections to to sort of improve the connections between um, between different neighborhoods. Um, not all the time that we have to add or minus things. Sometimes it could just simply be about improving the quality of the existing streets. It could be expanding the streets, putting more greenery, putting in more cycling path, for example. Um, and I wanted to say that, of course, I did not uh, invent this. This is part of um, the space and tax uh, in, in London. So it's a, it's a consultancy as well as a, a lab at the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL. Uh, so I was doing my PhD at UCL and also working for Space and Tax Limited. So other things that they do is also, um, you know, uh, provide uh, solutions for consultancies, architects and developers. So they also did an uh, open mapping of the, the UK, where everyone can have access to these models for free. And also the Citizen Explorer, where it's an interactive tool for urban planners that you can use it to plan, um, you know, where's the best location to put uh, their amenities and facilities. Um, they also do urban value modeling, and they are also currently developing a walkability uh, index. Um, at the, using this modeling, we can do both urban. Uh, so on the left is a Trafalgar Square uh, example where we used to test um, pedestrian connectivity. But we also can do uh, building analysis for complex buildings. So we're able to measure which areas are more accessible, which areas are more visible. And then we are able to identify which, um, you know, uh, which uh, areas should go, uh, should go best. So it's more of area allocation. I will touch very briefly on the science behind the model. One of the measures that we use is choice, which is uh, between us centrality, which came from graph theory and network science uh, uh, theories. Basically, it's the shortest path from any point to any point in the model. And it can be unweighted and uh, weighted. So for weighting, you can be, for example, it could be angular change. It could be putting uh, population data, land use data. So you, the model is able, able to make uh, um, you know, better, uh, better analysis. For this model in particular, we look at segment angular analysis. So um, basically, we give a weighting based on how much uh, change the, uh, the street to street has. So if the, we give priority to the streets that are minimal in angular change, and if there's a more than a 90 degree uh, change, then there'll be a higher uh, weighting. So this is an um, example of the Singapore model. This is a pedestrian uh, model. And we can see that here, okay, let me, yeah, this is a global uh, choice accessibility. And if you see the red lines are the highest in, um, uh, in accessibility and the blue is the lowest. And it goes from red, orange, uh, green, and blue. And this is a global choice and then the beauty of this model is able to um, do a multi-scalar analysis so that we can look at different radiuses of the model. So if you look at 5,000, you can see the difference already global to, um, let me just take away this. Sorry. 
Yeah, so this you can see uh, 5,000 scale, 5,000 meters, and then 3,000 meters, 2,000, and uh, 1,200. So what this shows is that it shows that at the lowest uh, radius, for example, 2,000, it gives us insight on where the um, accessible streets are in the neighborhood scales. It gives us clues into, if you look into a radius like 1,200 meters, where are the uh, emerging uh, accessible roads that might not be uh, seen on the global uh, level. And this is important because when we want to plan like pedestrian path, we would usually look at the, the more local scale, for example, 800 meters. And then zooming in into um, one of the projects that we're looking at CLC, which is the Badok Katong area. And I'll just quickly go through here um, the different scales for 5,000. If you look at Dunman uh, Road, for example, Dunman Road on the global scale, you see is like a yellow, green, I mean, all this has values. The colors is just for uh, representing them easily. If you go to 5,000, you see it becomes more orange and then it becomes higher and higher uh, accessible as you go, as the radius gets lower and lower. So at 1,200 meters, you can see Dunman Road, it's uh, very accessible, this area. And this um, will inform us, you know, what's the behavior of the street like? So at a global scale, it's not accessible, meaning that you know, it might not be an expressway or a, a vehicular road. But at a local level, it's very accessible. So it, it gives insights into that. So maybe this street could be used for more of, a, more of an intimate, um, it could be a retail connection, it could be a small retail path. It could have um, you know, whatever the, the, plan, the, the planners um, thing will be useful for. So we use this type of like, uh, analysis to give planners advice and also, you know, to work in projects uh, in CLC. So um, I'm not sure if I said this, but the accessibility means you no know, potential for human movement. So if it's a uh, high, uh, if it's red on the 800 scale, a very local scale, it shows that it has the potential for higher human movement at this scale. And one of the recent uh, things we have done with the SLA 3D sandbox is we took this model, went down to the Geobox um, uh, sandbox office, and we are able to use uh, Singapore's 3D model and then uh, insert our model inside to help us visualize. So these are not, these are different colors, but in, in general, I think for, you know, if we are doing presentations to stakeholders and people, people like yourself, it's just easier to visualize, um, it's easier to visualize with 3D models that you can, one can easily see, you know, put their fingers on, you know, uh, where is where. Um, I'll skip this. So today, if I have enough time, I would use uh, three um, case studies, mini case studies. I just want to add that we just started this project very recently, I think three months ago, and we are trying to get, I, so we spent the last two, three months getting buy-ins from agencies and then getting interest explaining to people what the street modeling can do for them. And then slowly we see, um, you know, how we can help agencies. So HDB, uh, LTA, URA, um, we've been talking to them and they've been giving us use cases on how we can help them. So we have this initial very prelim uh, analysis that we have uh, generated. So the first one is the um, doing some studies on the East Coast Park of accessibility from homes to the East Coast Park entrances. So just jump straight into it. Uh, those, you can see the white dots, the white points, which are the East Coast entrances. Then we just did a catchment or uh, isochrone from the East Coast entrances to the streets. And then we, um, we uh, plug this in into the residential homes. So you can see on the blue, um, the blue plots, that means homes that are close to the East Coast Park entrances, the lighter green are further away. And because we're measuring accessibility, we also want to look at uh, bus stops. So to go to East Coast Park, you, the, the, there's a feeder bus 401. So we mapped out where all the 401 buses are. And then also looking at from the bus stops, where is a five minute walk, five or 10 minute walk away from each bus stop. 
So we can see the streets that are accessible to this bus stop that can lead them to take the bus to go to the rest of the, uh, to the East Coast entrances. Then we, so this is a series of visualization that helps to inform uh, the planners and also to ourselves, you know, how can we go about doing this? And then we also incorporated the cycling path from your ages are the proposed cycling path. Um, and then we added on the, um, the street network model that tells us, okay, at where are the accessible uh, streets at 5,000 meters scale? The point of doing this is um, firstly, um, we want to see, okay, how can cycling path help to uh, gain um, the people accessibility from their homes to East Coast Park? So, um, yes, yeah, so it's a way to make informed decisions. And if we were to make a new cycling path, where should we put it? So that's how we use the, the choice, the accessibility model to look at how we can determine uh, all this. So I just have three more minutes. Yeah. And then the next thing we did was East Coast GRC. And we uh, studied how, you know, where all the amenities. So we got all this data from uh, the various uh, open street map or some from the URA land use master plan also data.gov.sg. And we looked at how the different um, amenities like tertiary schools um, doing catchment, how accessible are they from the homes? So looking at hawker centers as well, polyclinics, parks, and uh, mapping them. So we, we um, plug them into the residential plots. And what we can see here is that um, from um, the homes to amenities, how far they are. So if you look at the bottom, you see all the different amenities like parks, hawker centers, polyclinics, and you see the cutoff point here at 1,600 meters, 20 minute walk. That's because that's the uh, LTA goal for 2040 that all uh, amenities should be 20 minute walk away from your home. So we can see, you know, which are the amenities that, which are the homes that are, um, you know, doesn't meet, meet the cut yet. So each point represents a home. And then we divided them into non-landed and landed. And then, so non-landed um, usually, uh, maybe HDBs and landed for you know landed property and it, it's I feel less important because it could be indicator for you know social economic background and your reliance on uh, cars if you use cars as a as a transport so we can see over here you know where are the amenities that are, are, are not within 20 minutes and you know if it's not within 20 minutes this is how we you know think if it's not within 20 minutes are you going to build a new polyclinic uh, just because your house is not near 20 minutes might not be, right, because it's not practical. So this is how we can possibly say, hey, if this cluster of homes are not near, not within 20 minutes, how about we put cycling routes near to these houses so they're able to accelerate um, this uh, form of commune. So this is uh, uh, how does, you know, the, the form, the thought process could be when we used to uh, do urban planning for Singapore. And then also using hawker centers as a start, we put in the cycling path, and then where um, the model, the, the street network model recommends uh, some cycling routes. So we can see how this all overlays, and then we can use it to make informed decisions. Um, yeah. So this, I'm running out of time. I'll just quickly show how HPC play a uh, role in, in this. So uh, basically we have a DEPEP X software, open source software, and to run analysis, it usually takes 24 to 48 hours. And plus I'm using my personal laptop. So it really burns my computer. So with the HPC, we are able to build DEPEP X software into the NSCC server. And then also uh, using the command line interface of the DEPEP X software, we're able to process it uh, by running that uh, X and you know remote access, and because we run different analysis from you know 800 scale to 1,200 meters, all these different radius, we're able to make use of HPC's uh, parallel computing to run this analysis very quickly. So from 48 hours, it became like two hours. So that's uh, that's really good. This is what uh, the screen, uh, what it composed of many uh, yeah many analysis. So uh, Vanessa, in my time is up. Yeah, right. thank you, Genevieve. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. All right. Uh, thank you, um, all the speakers. Uh, very interesting um, topics that you all of you have shared. Uh, I think we do have some questions uh, coming from the chat. Uh, prior to that, maybe can I uh, allow me to open up the platform if there's anybody who like to ask any question? All you need to do is just unmute yourself. 
is there any questions from the uh, audience? No? Okay, so be, be, before I pose some of the key questions, uh, I, I would like to actually uh, um, articulate uh, one important point. Uh, one of the question uh, that is always posed to us is, all right, so how do we use NSCC? You know, uh, my, my, my answer to that is that um, um, do um, share with us, do engage us. What is your problem statement or what is your uh, uh, outcome that you would like to achieve? The earlier you engage us, it will be easier for us to work collaboratively with you to, uh, to be able to uh, then see what are the gaps. For example, you may have certain gaps in terms of uh, scientists or you have certain gaps in your resources that you require. Then um, do, do not worry. We will, uh, we will, uh, from NSCC as well as uh, the rest of the speakers, will be more than happy to actually uh, reach out to you uh, and uh, help to find some uh, solution out of that. Whether it's a scientist from uh, ASTAR or some of the speakers here, I think they'll be most uh, able to advise you on that basis. Okay. So uh, 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 the earlier they reach out and give us more detail, that'll be the best. Um, Okay, I, I believe John Ting has a question, right? He has two questions. All right. So hear me now. Yes, John. Hi. Hey, right. Your question, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Fascinating session. Uh, I have two layman questions. One is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the visual shown by A star to transport a tree vertically. I don't think it's done in practice. You usually transport tree horizontally. So you don't worry about the drag that he's trying to do with his uh, supercomputer. Anyway, just a joke. Now, the real question is meant for CLC, I think. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm looking at your syntax. It's, oh, no. It seems like uh, your attribute is very limited to physical attributes. That's why my question is, does your attribute, when you do your values, uh, the valuation the, to, to give a value to your uh, accessibility. Do you take into consideration the psychological, social, cultural, historical value system, or just purely a physical thing? I know it's, it's probably physical because you are a physical planning, right? But anyway, I, I'd like the speaker to tell us. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, John. That was a good point. So this model, it's not a deterministic model. It's so it's a complex complexity model. So it's kind of a bottom uh, up model, if you will. It's not a top down model, which a lot of uh, models, you know, by LTA, you, you, you throw things inside and then you generate and then it gives you a final answer. This is the best choice to go A to B. What the space syntax model, uh, it's actually based on social theories that, you know, for example, humans walk in a straight line. So the more changes in angle, the more cost it is to the to the model, who's more more weighted. So it based on these social theories, um, and of course this model this model is is built, you know, it's it's progressive. It's not this not the end. It's people are still working on this model. Mm. So based on this social uh, social theory on this model, we are able to. Uh, um, generate uh, emergent behaviors. So it's a complexity science model, in in a way. So by by generating this Im emergent behavior, we make the model flexible and adaptable so that it can we, it can take in change. So this model is just a baseline model. After we run this model first cut, we are able to put more information into it. For example, rental prices, uh, population data, income level. Um, to these streets. So we can plug data into these streets, but, but carefully and slowly. We don't want to plug everything too, too fast that we don't, we, don't, we don't know what is what. So by doing this systematically, we can test for certain uh, you know, insights that will help in urban planning. Oh, uh, thank you so much. So it's actually a beginning of a project. You're constructing the structural backbone, so to speak, right? Yes, you yes. You up with a lot more attributes so that it become a very rich system because I let you comment about how to determine or how to uh, evaluate whether a street is uh, um, a good potential for commercial, retail, or just for leisure. And that attracts my attention. That's why I asked my, my question. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you.
Okay, uh, next up, uh, Eugene from uh, SJ. There's a question for you. Uh, um, from George Shi, he likes to know whether your flood modeling results have been validated in Singapore or not. Any research content with regards to this flood modeling itself? Yep. Thanks, George. Good question. Uh, answer is yes, it's validated in Singapore. We are working with uh, NTU uh, in our SJ Corp Lab to get it uh, mm -hmm. uh, not only validated because it's compound model, so it's a little bit complex. Uh, uh, but we are also then taking past records of floods in Singapore mm -hmm. uh, and just to compare historical records to just to build the build case. Now, we have actually mm -hmm. taken it further as well to bring this to overseas, uh, Vietnam, China, and also run that, that, that simulation as well. And, and very positive results has actually uh, emerged. Uh, I think we are just uh, months away from commercializing it. Um, I hope that answers your question, George. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Feel free uh, to unmute and then you could actually ask that question. Anyone? If not, there's another question that's coming is, what is the cost to use NSCC facilities? Okay, so so um, as an NR, right, uh, do take note that we are chartered for research, but we are not chartered for operation. Okay, so if you have a research project, R&D project, they are looking towards, uh, we welcome to have a conversation with you. Now, especially we have call for projects, whereby you are uh, invited to submit your uh, research brief as well as what you want, uh, what kind of resources would you like to have, whether it's a CPU or GPU or storage resources. Uh, uh, then we will have two independent committee that will make the assessment whether if, if this particular project uh, um, uh, uh, fits our requirement. And that's where we will allocate you the right resources. Now, eventually, if your organization grows substantially and has a huge substantial use for uh, HPC or supercomputer, then we will be then talking about uh, 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 doing some cost recovery on that basis. But uh, for a start, uh, I will encourage you to utilize the uh, national research infrastructure, supercomputing resources that is available now for your R&D uh, if you may, on that basis, okay? So, um, but what very, very important is that uh, um, it um, uh, will be uh, sharing with you when uh, various, uh, these various calls for project will be available and you can actually tap on it, okay? Now, uh, we are here to support and also to, um, uh, go on this journey with all of you. So feel free to reach out to us and we'll be more than happy. Um, thank you so much, all, all of you. Thank you, speakers. And thank you for all the attendees' time. Uh, and we hope that uh, this has been fruitful and informative for all of you. Uh, I wish uh, all of you a very good weekend and also stay safe.